Hey, what's up everybody? Don't watch this video on an empty stomach because I'm about to analyze Kellogg. Okay, but seriously, with a lot of overvalued tech companies out there, some of you guys requested that I analyze some food companies, so we're going to start with Kellogg. If you're new to the channel, my name is Dan. I'm a business school professor focused on accounting and finance. This channel is all about investing, so if you like videos like this, hit the subscribe button to check out more videos. All right, let's get started. All right, guys, this is Kellogg's. If you haven't heard of Kellogg's, I really don't know what to say to you. They make food. You know, I, I'm just getting hungry looking at this. You know, they're mostly known for their Kellogg's cereal, but they're really into a lot of foods. They have a lot of different brands. And so they have, you know, a pretty well diversified portfolio in that respect. So here is their revenue and operating profit by geographic region. Obviously, they're, they're dominant in North America. They got about $8.3 billion of revenue, about $1.2 billion worth of their profit. But you can also see, you know, the European segment there, Latin America and Africa, Middle East and Asia. What's interesting to notice here is that their profit margin is so much higher in North America. You take 1.2 billion divided by about 8.4 billion, you end up with about 14% profit margin compared with just 9% for Latin America and Africa, Middle East and Asia. Here are some stats about Kellogg's balance sheet. Right away I can see they're, you know, they have fairly high leverage there, about 80% liabilities to assets ratio. And that the debt portion of those liabilities makes up a considerable amount there. As far as liquidity, you know, it's not a great picture there either, with a current ratio of less than 0.7, quick ratio about 0.4. You know, you're going to generally find lower numbers when you look at grocery stores and, and food manufacturers like this. However, you know, I don't like to see it so low. I, I would like it to be a little bit higher. You can also see their interest coverage ratio. You know, given that debt level, this is not altogether surprising. You know, their earnings before interest and taxes can only cover their interest expense about 6.4 times. That's cutting it real close and not a great financial situation there. They don't really have a lot of extra cash on hand. Now, they do have about 80% of their assets are long term. I would note though that I looked at their balance sheet and you're looking at a good 30% of their assets are goodwill, you know, intangibles, brand value and stuff like that. So it's not as if they actually have to have, you know, that much property plan equipment. All right, so here's a DuPont analysis. What we're doing is looking at return on equity. So important to us. We want to know how much net, net income did you generate given the equity investments by the, the equity holders, the stockholders. And we're going to break that down to three parts. So first of all, they have a pretty impressive ROE. I like the profitability. But notice it's mostly driven by leverage. You know, equity multiplier approaching eight in some years. Ridiculously high. When it, when it comes to their, you know, organic profitability, it's actually quite low, which is common with this type of company, but it is worth noting. Net income margin, how much profit you generate for every dollar of sales you got, you know, for them, uh, it, it's around, I would say, an average of eight cents, you know, eight and a half cents of profit for every dollar of sales. Not that impressive. Asset turnover is not great either. You know, for every dollar of assets, how much how much sales can you generate? Uh, for them, the answer is, you know, a solid 0.8 on average. So 80 cents. Uh, you put these two together, that's your organic profitability. Then you multiply it by your, your equity multiplier, your leverage. So, you know, yes, impressive ROE, but, you know, remember, it's driven by debt. Okay, here's a quick look at Kellogg's stock. It's down about 10% over the past year. If we zoom out a bit, look at the 10 year return. It's about 12.3%, but also consider that they have a dividend. So that's not really factoring the dividend. You've probably had a decent little return there over the 10 year period if you factor that in. They are trading for about 14.8 times next period's earnings. 
They pay a nice dividend there with a yield of about 3.8%. They have some short interest worth noting. About 6% of their shares have been borrowed and sold short. And they are about a $20 billion company. Now, high debt is fine if you're growing. If your assets grow significantly every year, eventually those ratios will kind of correct themselves. You'll actually have low leverage. Your interest coverage ratio will naturally expand as your profits expand. You know, the problem for Kellogg here is that, you know, I look at their revenue stream over time. It's really not a picture of growth. It's more a picture of stagnation. They went from about $13.2 billion of revenue 10 years ago to where they are today, $13.7 billion. Okay, so while revenues aren't growing, let's take a look at their margins and see if those are growing over time. In blue, I have gross margin. That has not really improved over time. I could argue it's actually gotten worse in the past five years. If we look in red here, we're looking at operating margin. That has really been pretty consistent. I don't see they have room to really grow that. So that's not a good signal either. Now the past may not be a good indication of the future. So it's definitely worth checking analyst forecast to see what the expected growth in earnings is going to be. What I can see here is a pretty good consensus that earnings are not really growing by much. You know, you've got the low, you've got the high, but they're not too far apart. In general, analysts don't see the company growing much going forward. Okay guys, at this point in the video, I want to use an intrinsic valuation model to value Kellogg's stock. This process is going to be relatively straightforward because analysts are not expecting really any growth in Kellogg's earnings or revenues. In addition, Kellogg's has been around forever, and when you look at the past history, most recently, they have a pretty steady in margins. So, you know, there's not a lot of things that are, are in flux here, not a lot of things that are changing. It's going to be a straightforward process. I'll use the free cash flow to equity model, and to forecast the next five years, I'll assume some type of growth rate in free cash flows based on what people are forecasting. It could be anywhere from 0 to 5%, the most optimistic level, uh, growth in free cash flows. As far as the discount rate, I'm going to show you guys what the value would be under different discount rates. But if you look at their balance sheet, I would favor you know, maybe an 8% discount rate. So here's the valuation matrix. Each cell here represents the fair value of Kellogg given a certain discount rate or required rate of return and given a certain growth rate in free cash flows to equity over the next five years. After five years, we're just going to assume they continue to grow cash flows at about 1.5% per year. So according to this matrix, you know, no matter how you slice it, it's not a good deal. I mean, which sells most likely though? You know, based on the forecast, I could probably give them at most, you know, an average of 3% growth in cash flows over the next five years. So I'm kind of in this, this column right here. Uh, what is my discount rate? Well, okay, you saw their balance sheet. I can't go less than 8%. So my best is $42.10. You know, I think I could probably argue for a 9% discount rate as well. So not a good deal. Uh, you know, another way of looking at this whole thing is to say, look, this discount rate is my required rate of return. I only require a 6% rate of return. I think they'll grow at, say, 4%. So then it could be worth as much as $67.30 for me because I only want a 6% rate of return. That's fine if you want a you know, low rate of return. I would argue, though, there's a lot of alternative investments that have a lot less risk than Kellogg. I wouldn't do that. I would, I would stick with the higher discount rate for the riskier company. So in the matrix below, you can get a better sense of that. You can kind of visualize it. It gives the percentage that the company is overvalued by if it's in red or undervalued by if it's in green. Not a pretty picture there. If you like the content so far, please hit that like button. It helps the channel a lot. One last fact to look at is insider trading. In the past three months, it got 13 sales, zero buys, not positive. 
looking at the number of shares involved here, you know, you can even look at the last 12 months. The last 12 month period, you got like 2 million shares sold, only 68,000 shares bought. The past three months, nobody's buying, everyone's selling. Not a good signal. All right, everyone. So here are my final thoughts on Kellogg. First of all, I think it's generally a mediocre company. You're looking at, you know, a company that makes solid profits over time, but nothing that impressive. There's not a lot of room for growth right now, both, you know, historically and when we look at analyst forecasts. So these companies are pretty easy to value. If a company is not growing its earnings, you can pretty much look at that P.E. ratio to get a rough estimate of its value. And, you know, for Kellogg, it's just not that great of a deal for me. You know, you look at their balance sheet, it definitely comes with risks, okay? You know, this company has significant leverage. They have a pretty low interest coverage ratio. If their interest rate goes up, you know, if rates go up and they, they have to uh, pay a higher interest cost, they're going to be buried in interest expense. So, you know, for a company that comes with risks, I think they're richly priced. I mean, you look at some of the, you know, your other options for investing. You've got companies like I reviewed last week, A. Holdale Hayes, trading at 13 times earnings, and they're actually growing a little bit more. Um, so I just don't see it for Kellogg. It's going to be a hard pass for me. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you for watching.